Welcome back to Killer Stories. I'm your host, Bobby Holmes. I hope you all had a chance to tune in last week and hear my guest, Jennifer Barlow, tell the story of her uncle, Stephen Manolis. He was convicted of a murder that took place in 1996. Jennifer recently finished writing a book about how she believes Stephen was wrongly convicted and has the facts to back it up. We had a great conversation, but I'm sure it only scratched the surface. As soon as her book is available, I will provide a link for you all. This week, I have another story suggestion sent in from listener Jay Smith. And I'm not going to lie, this one is especially rough. It's the death of three-year-old Nia Glassy. This toddler endured months of child abuse from multiple adults within her home. If cases involving children are triggering for you, this one may not be your cup of tea. I will give a warning before I enter the discussion of abuse that is especially disturbing. July 22, 2007, Nia Glassy was admitted to a New Zealand hospital. Her mother, Lisa Kuka, stated that Nia fell off her boyfriend's shoulders and landed on her head. Nia was unconscious and barely breathing. The hospital staff rushed her back for emergency care. After fully evaluating Nia, it was clear that there was more to this story than simply falling off someone's shoulders. She had serious abdominal injuries, brain hemorrhaging, and burns on her head and feet. As a parent, it's our job to protect our children, do whatever it takes to keep them safe. But Lisa Kuka not only sat back while Nia's stepfamily abused her baby, she failed to seek medical attention when it was desperately needed. By the time she finally took Nia to a hospital, it was far too late. Let's get a little more background information so you can understand this family dynamic. There's a lot of people in this story, and it can become very confusing. I will do my best to simplify it. Lisa Kuka was one of 17 children. Yes, you heard that right, 17. I know of the Duggar family, and they have that beat, but honestly, how is this even physically possible? As a woman who has gone through pregnancy, delivery, and recovery— How can your body do that consecutively for basically the span of your adult life? Craziness. As you can imagine, Lisa and her siblings were pretty much on their own as there was always a new baby that needed their parents' attention. Perhaps this is why she turned out to be such an inattentive mother herself. Nia Maria Glassy was born April 25, 2004 in Tokoroa, New Zealand. We have already introduced her mother, Lisa Kuka. Her father was Glassy Glassy Jr. Yes, his first and last name were both Glassy. They lived together as a family for the first six months of Nia's life, until Glassy stepped out on Lisa and cheated on her with her niece. Very classy, Glassy. Glassy then leaves New Zealand and moves to Australia, leaving Nia behind with her mother. Moving forward, he was completely absent in her life. Now might be a good time to mention that Nia was not an only child. Lisa had a total of six children, Nia being the youngest. Three of her children lived elsewhere, but Nia and her two older sisters, Esther and Jessie, lived with Lisa. Lisa and her three daughters then moved to Rotorua, New Zealand. When Nia was two years old, Lisa was 32, Lisa began dating 17-year-old Wiremu Curtis. And don't judge me if I butchered that name. There are quite a few names in this story I am bound to screw up. And in case you didn't catch that, Lisa's 32, Wiremu 17. I don't know the laws in New Zealand, but by my standards, Wiremu is a minor. In the winter of 2006, Lisa, her three children, and Wiremu moved into a small one-bedroom apartment with Wiremu's father, William. But there were even more occupants in this tiny apartment. William's other two children, Hoena, Michael, Michael's girlfriend, Orwa, and their daughter. So let's count. That is 10 people living in a one-bedroom apartment. 
William, Wiremu's father, slept in the bedroom alone while the remaining five adults and four children slept in the living area. I get it's his place, but dang, that's a lot of people sleeping in a living room while you are comfy in your own bed. Just to give you an idea of this crowd of people, William Curtis was a member of the Black Power Gang in the area and was not someone you would want to mess with. He regularly beat his own children and wife. She was lucky enough to get away from William, but his kids stuck around. Michael Curtis, Wiremu's brother, was intellectually challenged. At the time of this crime, he was 21, but he had the brain of a 12-year-old. He and Ariwa started dating when they were preteens. Michael was an extremely bad influence on her, and she became addicted to meth at age 12 and she was only 14 when they had their daughter. The abuse on Nia started in this environment, beginning with William, Wiremu's father. He would slap the two-year-old regularly and even drew blood on occasion. He once wrapped a scarf around Nia's neck and held her high above the ground. Once she was on the verge of passing out, he let go and she dropped to the ground. Now, William was not one of the five people responsible for the abuse that led to Nia's death, but he was later charged for this abuse once it came to light. In March of 2007, Lisa, as well as her three children and Wiremu, moved into a three-bedroom home in Kotu, New Zealand. But once again, they piled in more people. And here's where I think it begins to get complicated keeping track of names. Wiremu's brother, Michael Curtis, and his girlfriend, Oriwa, as well as their daughter, followed them into this home. Lisa's nephew, 20-year-old Michael Pearson, stayed there too. But he wasn't there all the time, as he tended to couch surf with other friends. Lisa had a full-time job at a kiwi factory packing fruit. While she was at work, her children were in the care of her boyfriend, Wiremu, his brother, Michael, Michael's girlfriend, Oriwa, and at times, Lisa's nephew, who was also named Michael. See how this can get confusing? Anyways, one day, Wiremu and his brother, Michael, decided that Nia was ugly and decided to punish her for it. To call any three-year-old ugly is just messed up. But especially in this instance, as it is absolutely not true. Unfortunately, we don't have many photos of little Nia. The only one I could find was when she was around one and a half years old. But she has perfect olive skin and a beautiful smile. But that beautiful smile faded away as she began enduring abuse from her supposed loved ones. In July of 2007, Michael Curtis was about to celebrate his 21st birthday, People were coming and going to the house to get ready for the big party that Saturday. Friday evening, when Lisa returned home from work, she needed to run a few errands and took her daughter Jessie with her. Nia begged to come along with her mother, but Lisa insisted she stay behind with her sister Esther, who was eight years old. Once Lisa left, Wiremu and Michael threw Nia to the ground and took turns kicking her in the head. Esther later reported the kicks were, quote, hard as a rock. After these kicks, Nia fell unconscious. Her body would convulse, and the brothers made fun of her, saying her flailing arms looked like duck arms. They just picked her up and tucked her into her bed as if she were sleeping. When Lisa returned, she found Nia in her bed. Warmu and Michael stated that she was fine. Nia was just tired, so they had tucked her into bed. Saturday morning, everyone was awake and preparing for the big shindig that evening. Nia continued to sleep throughout the day. And Lisa didn't check in on her own daughter. She relied on Wiremu and Michael to do so, and they continued to report back that she was fine. Lisa couldn't be bothered to check on Nia because the 21st birthday of her underage boyfriend's brother was more important. You have to know something is wrong if your child does not wake up for over 16 hours. That afternoon, Lisa's sister Louise came to pick up the three children. 
they were going to have a sleepover at her house during the party. When she arrived, Nia was still unconscious. Lisa told Louise that Nia just had the flu and said, quote, promise me you won't take her to the hospital, unquote. I'm sorry, what? If someone needs a hospital visit, why wouldn't you take them? Unless you know something is wrong and you want to avoid that being discovered. Louise knew nothing of the abuse and thought that Nia was indeed just sleeping off a sickness. They piled her into the car and drove to Aunt Louise's for the night. Louise tucked Nia in and noticed that her hands were clenched and her limbs felt rigid. Around 4 a.m. on Sunday morning, eight-year-old Esther shook her Aunt Louise awake. She said that she checked on Nia and noticed that she was foaming at the mouth. Louise immediately packed all the kids into her car and phoned Lisa. She told her to get her ass out of bed, she was coming to pick her up, and they were going to the hospital. When Louise pulled in, Michael Curtis came outside and insisted that Nia was fine and she did not need to go to the hospital. Louise shut that down. Whether Lisa was coming along or not, she was taking Nia to the hospital. Lisa got in the car and rode along. And here we are, full circle to the beginning of our story. Except Lisa told Louise that Nia had the flu, and then she told the hospital staff she fell off Wiremuth's shoulders. The contradicting stories caused suspicion. While in the hospital, doctors were able to wake Nia up. Lisa pretended to be all motherly and gave her daughter a bath. Then she sent a text to her family. My girl, G-U-R-L, N, me, R, the letter R, fine. Believe, misspelled, what, W-O-T, you, the letter U, want to, as in the number two. So just to do that again, my girl and me are fine. Believe what you want to. Get some class, Lisa. Your daughter is literally dying because you sit back and allow your shithead boyfriend and his friends to abuse her for months and then refuse to seek medical attention when it is obviously necessary. At least have the decency to type in real words. Then, as Nia slipped back into a coma, Lisa leaves the hospital and goes clubbing. I shit you not. And she reports doing it to, quote, take her mind off it. The hospital staff quickly alerted police of their assumptions that Nia was being physically abused in her home. The residence was searched, and there were still remnants of a 21-year-old's birthday bash everywhere. Empty pizza boxes, liquor bottles, and beer cans. Not only that, but police discovered blood spatter on the walls that was haphazardly wiped up. Following an investigation, Wiremu Curtis, Michael Curtis, Oriwa Kemp, and Michael Pearson were arrested on July 28, 2008 for assault. Now, the kicks to the head are what put three-year-old Nia into a coma, but she endured horrific abuse for months leading up to this. And here is that trigger warning for those of you who may need to tap out. Most of this information is being reported by Nia's older sisters, who are 8 and 10 years old. And keep in mind, I am pretty sure this group of individuals were using drugs at the time. We do know that Michael and his girlfriend had a meth addiction. Here we go. Nia was placed into a folding sofa and sat on repeatedly. The group would watch wrestling on TV and then practice the moves on 3-year-old Nia, body slamming her to the ground. She was slapped, kicked, punched, spat on, and thrown against walls. They threw her inside of the garbage bin outside and dragged her through a sand pit without any clothes on. Nia was held high up to the ceiling and then let drop to the floor. They dropped large pieces of wood onto her little body. The brothers once put her inside of the dryer on a high setting for 30 minutes, and I am shocked this alone didn't kill Nia. She would kick the door open, but they would just shove her back inside. One of the other children in the home asked them to stop. She was just a little girl. But Michael Pearson turned and told her to shut up. She later reported in court that Wiremu and Michael Curtis are the ones who put Nia in the dryer, 
but it was Michael Pearson's idea. As you can imagine, at the end of the dryer cycle, Nia was extremely hot. Her body temperature was alarmingly high and she was unconscious. They put her in a cold bath and miraculously, Nia was revived. However, I am sure she suffered permanent damage from this incident. Nia's body was held above a fire, causing burns on her head and feet. Nia was tied to a clothesline and spun around in circles until she flew off. And this particular incident was witnessed by a neighbor. After hearing of her death, they were beside themselves with grief for not alerting the police about what they saw. But they lived in a low-income neighborhood, one where crime and drug use was high. Most people kept to themselves and avoided calling attention to the police. And remember, this is all supposedly because Wiremu and Michael Curtis thought Nia was ugly. Therefore, she deserved this abuse. For those of you on YouTube, look at these faces. No one here is winning any beauty contests. These people are scum of the earth, ugly both inside and out. Prison time doesn't even seem sufficient. I think their punishment should be to endure what they did to Nia day in and day out until the day they die. August 3rd, 2007, Nia Glassy succumbed to her injuries and died in the hospital. Her cause of death was swelling in the brain and a subdermal hematoma. Doctors say that if she was brought to the hospital immediately following the kicks to her head, she would have survived. But her mother, Lisa Kuka, allowed 36 hours to pass before she received medical attention. The charges were now changed from assault to murder, at least for Wiremu and Michael Curtis. Lisa Kuka, Oriwa Kemp, and Michael Pearson were charged with manslaughter. Glassy Glassy Jr., Nia's father, returned to town at the news of his daughter's death, but he did not attend the trial. He saw no sense in it. And honestly, I can't blame him. Of course, you want to see these monsters get what they deserve, but I wouldn't want to sit and listen to the details of what happened to Nia for hours on end. Having said that, the trial was especially difficult for the jurors to endure. It involved the testimonies of three young children and their experiences in the home and detailed descriptions of abuse on Nia. The judge offered all 11 jurors counseling following the trial to help cope with what they went through. Wiremu and Michael Curtis were found guilty of murder. They were sentenced to life in prison with a minimum non-parole period of 17 and a half years. They are currently still in prison. Oriwa Kemp and Michael Pearson were found not guilty of manslaughter, but were convicted of child cruelty. They both served three years in prison. Oriwa has given birth three times since her release, and all three children were taken by CYF, Child Youth and Family Services. William Curtis, father of Wiremu and Michael, the one who held Nia up by her neck with a scarf, he was also charged with child cruelty at a later date. Lisa Kuka was found guilty on two counts of manslaughter, one for failing to obtain medical treatment for the toddler before her death in August 2007, and one for failing to protect her. She was sentenced to nine years in prison. Lisa was paroled in 2014, but was sent back to prison after breaking the rules of her parole. First off, she was living at an unapproved address, and on top of that, she either had a child under the age of 16 living in the home or stay overnight, which was a no-no. She returned to prison to finish her sentence and was released on parole a second time in March of 2017. At the time of Nia's death, her older sisters, Esther and Jessie, were under the care of CYF. After Lisa's release, a meeting was set up to discuss supervised visits with her children. She didn't show up. Lisa has not responded to any calls from CYF, ultimately abandoning her girls. Esther and Jessie were placed into the care of Nia's paternal grandparents, Selena and Glassy Glassy Sr. 
Lisa Kuka does not have custody of any of her five living children, and I find that to be the best outcome. Hopefully, they have the chance to live a decent life and experience love from their current guardians. Because after hearing this story, I don't believe that Lisa has any love to give to her children. She didn't care if they were hurt or suffering. She is far too selfish to be a mother. If you made it to the end of today's story, I thank you for listening. I know this is extremely difficult to hear or understand how someone could do such a thing, let alone five individuals. Nia Maria Glassy was a sweet, innocent soul who was taken far too soon. The city of Rotorua was horrified by the news of what happened to her. When it happened, schools in New Zealand took a minute of silence out of respect and memory of the little girl. Each year, people gather at her gravestone and light candles on a cake to celebrate what would have been her birthday. It is safe to say that Nia Glassy will never be forgotten to those who live in New Zealand. If you are enjoying Killer Stories, please take a moment to leave a rating on Spotify or a written review on Apple Podcasts. It helps so much with exposure of the show. The biggest compliment is to share the podcast with your true crime-loving friends. If you would like to support the show, you can do so at buymeacoffee.com slash killer stories. You can give a one-time donation that is set up in increments of $5. Follow me on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok at Killer Stories Podcast, although I think it's been at least a year since I posted anything to TikTok, and I'm on Twitter at Killer Story Pod. As always, thanks so much for listening. Until next time, this has been a killer story.